Mary Poppins, Lynn Manuel Miranda, Emily Warburg, Ben Wishaw, producer John DeLuca, composer Mark Shaman, lyricist Scott Whitman, and screenwriter David McGee. Let's have a round of applause. Yeah. Because Rob Marshall single-handedly, uh, with his vision and his passion and his genius, uh, has brought back uh, the movie musical to our culture. And uh, he started when he burst on the scene with Oscar winning Chicago. He's made many musicals since then. And finally, the world gets to see Rob's first original musical film. So Rob, first question is, why Gary Poppins Returns? Gosh, um, thank you, Mark. And he's an extraordinary producer, can I just say that right now? Um, you know what I thought to myself when this came our way, my way? Um, if anybody's gonna do it, I would like to do it, because I, it, it, it was incredibly daunting at first, of course. But at the same time, I really felt like I have that film, as many of us on this panel do, in our blood. And I wanted to be able to, in, a, in an odd way, protect the first film and treat this film with great care and love. And, you know, musicals are, 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 are very difficult to do. An original musical, there's so many layers to it. But with this one, you know, creating an original musical from scratch was actually, for me, a dream. And I would never done it before. And to be able to create it with this beautiful company was exactly what I was hoping for. And I, I have to say the guiding message of this film about finding light in the darkness is honestly what drew me to it and kept guiding me throughout the whole process, including till this very moment, you know, when people are actually now seeing the film. Because it feels so current to me that, and, and I'm just speaking for myself, but I, I, I feel people need this film now. And I, and I certainly knew that I wanted to live in that world and be part of that. And sending that message out into the world now of looking for hope and light in a dark time. And that's why we set our film in the, in the Depression era in London, the time of the books. Um, it, was, it was really so you could feel accessible and feel like it's a, a story that needs to be told now. Rob, you said this is your most personal film. Why is that? Because I think that philosophy that I was just describing is honestly how I feel deeply. Um, I think you have to approach, it's like, a, it's a life choice, I guess. You have to, you have to get up and approach your life in a, in a certain way and to look at it from the angle, from a different point of view, which is in our film too, um, from the point of view of looking for the light. Um, it's in the P.L. Travers books. It's, it's about finding that childlike joy in life which might sound trivial to some, but for, to me it's very profound. And I, and, and I honestly was able to explore that idea in making this film. It was incredibly hard work, probably the hardest work I've ever had to do on a film, but at the same exact time, incredibly joyous for that very reason. Well, anyone who works with you has experienced that doing that life. It comes from you, and it's there every day, no matter how hard everybody's working. So. It hopefully shows in every, I believe it shows in every frame of the film, so all that love and passion. Emily, Emily, Emily. So, <laughs> um, how did this come about for you? When, I mean, I know, but share with us how it came about for yourself. I think you even called my agent and said, something big's coming down the pipe for, 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 for Emily. And, and I got a, a um, voicemail from Rob, who is my dear friend, and we have known each other a long time. And the voicemail certainly had a sort of charged energy to it. Like I was like, oh my god, what is it? You know, what is this project? And um, and when he called me, you know, because he, he is so beautifully ceremonious and wants every moment of the process to feel special and transporting and memorable for you, that even the phone call had such a sense of ceremony to it. And um, and he said, you know, we've been digging through the Disney archives and you know. And, and by far the most prized possession. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I couldn't think like, what it was. You know, when you said Mary Poppins, I felt like the air changed in the room. It was so extraordinary, such an extraordinary, rather unparalleled moment for me because 
I was filled with with an instantaneous yes, but also with some trepidation, you know, all happening simultaneously in that moment because she is so iconic. She she had such a big imprint on my life and and, and on everyone's lives, you know, she people hold this character so close to their hearts. Um, and so, you know, how do I create my version of her? What will my version of her be? Because there's no point, no one wants to see me do a sort of cheap impersonation of Julie Andrews, because no one is Julie Andrews. And so she should be preserved and treasured in, in her own way of what she did. And so I knew this was going to be um, something that I wanted to take a big swing with, and I knew I could do it with this man, who is the most evolving, meticulous, brilliant director in the world. And, um, and I was in safe hands with him, however much I knew I had my work cut out for me. Okay, and can I just add one quick thing, that there's not another person on this planet who would play that part but you. Right. Your work is always so sublime and so seamless. I never see you. I see whoever it is you're playing in such an exquisite way. And, and what did you draw from? How, where did it come from? What, all the different colors that you painted with this character, because she's complicated and nuanced and it's such a sophisticated performance. Where did you find it all? Thank you. I mean, I, I, I found the, the books to be a huge springboard and um, enormously helpful. You know, they, she leapt off the page at me, just in how complicated she is, how unknowable she is in this wonderful way. That duality of the character, you know, that she's, she is stern, and she is incredibly rude, you know, and vain, and but like funny, you know, and, and yet there is this humanity, and she has to herself have such a childlike wonder in her in order to want to infuse these children's lives with it and, and there must under there be a generosity of spirit to want to fix and heal in the way that she does you know so I think for me and certainly for Rob when we talked about it in the you know, year and a half we spent before we even started rehearsing you know we we talk about her so much and and we both wanted to find those those layers and those moments of humanity um, and also the fact that she's probably a bit of an adrenaline junkie. Like she loves these adventures. It's, it's like her, her outlet, you know. Um, so just finding those moments so she's not just one thing, you know, because she is so enigmatic. And it was the great, such a delicious character to play. Loved it. And it shows, by the way. Lynn, so uh, renowned Broadway. Um, I remember seeing you the first time in the Heights. And and, and why she burst forth on stage. <laughs> Here's your first big movie experience. How did it come about, and how was the experience? Um, well, first of all, before any of that, I remember going to the midnight premiere screening of Chicago in the Ziegfeld Theater, R.I.P. Ziegfeld Theater, and, um, and seeing Chicago with everyone else with had the premier date sort of written in blood on their calendars um, and seen the greatest modern movie musical uh, I'd ever seen in my life. Um, so when I got a call from uh, Rob Marshall and John DeLuca, we, we'd like to talk to you about something. Um, that became an immediate priority. They came to uh, buy me a drink between shows. I was still in Hamilton at the time. Um, and I had a two-show day. So I finished the matinee, rolled across the streets to the Paramount Hotel, and. Um, and met them for a drink, and they said, uh, sequel to Mary Poppins. And I said, who's playing Mary Poppins? Uh, and they said, and they and I said, oh, that's good. <laughs> uh, and, and, and honestly, I, 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 can't, I can't give them enough credit for seeing this role in me, because when I'm playing Hamilton, I mean, there's no childlike wonder in Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> uh, he, he has a very traumatic early life. He goes on that stage and he wants to devour the world and he wants to move so fast and he wants to do everything. Whereas Jack, in this movie, as they pitched him to me, has this childlike sense of wonder. He has this, um, you know, he's, he's in touch with that imagination you all see in your kids when they can sort of play in their own imagination for hours. Jack sort of never lost that. 
Um, and, and that was, um, I feel so humbled that she saw that in me and, and that, you know, from that moment, from that drink, I was in. Um, and then, you know, it was, it came along at the perfect time for my family too. You know, we had finished a year of performing Hamilton and then I chopped my hair off and left the country and jumped into <laughs> Mary Poppins' universe. It was like beautiful. And your favorite part of making the film or favorite experience in the film? There are so many. I mean, you've seen the film. There are a lot of highs on a movie like this. Um, and coming from this theater where you're, you're, the only thing that changes in the performance is the audience and your energy that day to go, okay, Thursday we'll be shutting down Buckingham Palace and riding with 500 bicyclists. And Friday you'll be, you know, dancing with the penguins. Um, <laughs> You know, those kinds of, of moments are, are really sort of unforgettable. But for me, um, I brought my son to set every time we built a musical number. Uh, and to watch his eyes like saucers while Daddy danced with, you know, what seems like 500 dancers and bikers. I'll never forget the look on his face as long as I live. Emily Morton, I remember in the making of the film, we had a lot of logistical challenges to get you back and forth with your family, but you seemed undaunted and so determined to participate in this movie and of course your work is so quite lovely in it. Just your your feeling stepping into the shoes of a, of a character that was a child the world knows and now grown up and, and the experience of being in a musical film as opposed to, to a drama. Um, well, uh, gosh, yes, so all of that um, <laughs> that's very true. Um, I've got so many things to say. Um, uh, I, I felt from the minute that I met Rob that I wanted to be part of this film. Um, I, of course, Mary Poppins was a huge part of my childhood as it, as it is of everybody's. Um, but it was really, and, and, and it was exciting to think that, that, that they were going to make another movie of it, but, and, and daunting too, obviously. But it was meeting Rob and hearing him talk like he has just now about why he so, was so determined to make this film and uh, that just, really inspired me, um, and, and, um, and, I, and, and that doesn't often happen, and, when, and I, I'm quite old now, and I've done a lot of movies, <laughs> and I know enough about life to know, um, or, or life as an actor or performer or whatever, to know that when somebody inspires you and makes you excited uh, about the idea of a, of a movie or a project or whatever, it's, it's a rare thing, and, and you just have to go with it, you just have to try to jump on that train if you can. And so I, I imagine meeting Rob and John and, and, and run up my agents and meeting is that I just have to be part of this movie no matter what. I just want to be in it. I just want to be help Rob tell this story. And and then they managed to make it work but it was it was really uh, you know it was it was a complicated logistical thing for me because I live in New York and my kids and husband were there and um, and the filming was in was in London, so I, I think I flew um, I think I flew like sixteen times across the Atlantic. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and um, uh, I've got a lot of air miles, which I feel like I, I should give you. Um, but, and, but it was such it was, and, and there was a lot going on in my life at the time. My my, my father-in-law wasn't well, and, and there was all. all uh, it was just an incredible, uh, it just felt like an incredible good fortune every time I walked on the set to be there and um, and as Lynn said, just every single moment was, was magical. It was like sort of intravenous entertainment. It was almost dangerous. Um, it was almost too much at times. Um, and, um, and, and getting to know Ben and having that friendship was immediate and so sweet and it was just it was, the whole thing was 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 magical and um, and, and something I'll treasure forever and uh, I feel very lucky to have been a part of. And as to the bit about how to do this part, um, it's a no, really I don't know really it was it, it was like Rob it was a sleight of hand of Rob's where he is the puppet monster and he's absolutely kind of Mary Poppins himself like it, it's a stealth he is Mary Poppins. It's, he's Mary Poppins without the parrot. Um, and like, it's a sort of, well, the rude is, yeah, he's a nice Mary Poppins. But he manages to just, you just sort of know what to do without having to worry about it too much. And he's protecting you from all the anxiety and the, the sort of, 
stress of the burden of knowing that this is this is such a huge thing and this is such a huge um, you know legacy and we're in charge of it and he, there's, there's none of that came into it. It was just we've got to just do this. We've got to have fun doing this. We've got to do right by this in the best sweetest way. And it was just a, a joy and 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 I think the key to um, well, one of the only thing I really thought about in preparing for Buff Jane was, uh, in, in terms of what I took from the original movie, was, was those two parents who were just such brilliant characters in the original movie. The mother and the father, Dennis Johns and David uh, Tomlinson. And um, they're so eccentric, they're so kind of out to lunch, both of them. And, and they're sort of, on one hand, terrible parents, and then on the other hand, full of love. They're completely yeah. absent. <laughs> And, and, um, and they make you feel better about your own failed parents and your own failure, and your own failure as a parent. Um, and, and I just felt like, oh, what would this girl be? Who would this girl be that had those two people that stuck in the room? And, um, and that was how I put it. You know, there's a lovely Easter egg in the film. There are many Easter eggs in the film. One of them, of course, is a, is a cameo by Karen Dotris, who played the original Jane. What was that like meeting her in, in, in that moment? It was extraordinary. She's such a great, cool lady, so funny. Wicked sense of humor, really down to earth and, and ballsy. And she, she, came, she came to do the cameo work. And then there's a little moment where Ben's emerging from the house with his briefcase late, and he bumps into her. And, and, and we're, we're, we're there together. And, and she was, and Rob, uh, we did it so she, we all walked onto the set for the first time with her, and um, she walked onto Cherry Tree Lane for the first time in 54 years, or however long it is since the uh, first movie was made. And, and she just melted. I mean, she just sort of crumbled. I mean, that was so moving being there with her while that happened and seeing that. We were fortunate to have a number of those kind of experiences, just really quickly, maybe just to go quick about what it was like having Dick Van Dyke mm. and what he said and how he came onto the set. I mean, every one of us was there, and it was beyond. I don't think any of us could even breathe that day because we couldn't believe that we were touching that. And he was basically playing the same old banker that he played. He grabbed my hand as we walked onto the set and he turned to me and he said something I will never forget. He said, I feel the same spirit here on the set that I did in the first film. And that was, you know, that was the dream that you were there. I was so moved when um, my favorite moment on the set of the whole, of the whole filming was when, a after Dick did his monologue uh, to the kids in the bank, Rob, we were all waiting for Rob to call cut because he was waiting quite a long time. And like, he couldn't because of all the emotion he was crying. And he couldn't literally say the word. And it was it, just realizing that was so, so touching. I think Emily called God because I, <laughs> <laughs> I said it's awesome. Huh? <laughs> You're going to wish off. So Ben, uh, similarly, you have the you're playing a character now grown up, but sort of so iconic as a little boy um, with those big eyes and, and, and had such an impact on somebody. Did the original film have an impact on you? And then how did you go about creating such an honest, indelible, uh, moving portrayal of this, of this man, single man trying to hold on to his family, and his home, and ultimately his childhood? Well, I was... <coughs> I was obsessed with the film when I was a child. It, it was the first thing, I, the first film I ever saw. And my dad taped it off the telly on a VHS, a VHS tape. And I watched it obsessively in my whole childhood. And I used to dress up as Mary Poppins and parade <laughs> up and down the street in our village. And um, so it, it had a huge, uh, like mythical, uh, it's a, a mythic part of my childhood. So I was, <laughs> I was so sort of moved every day because, of course, it's moving to, and you don't expect it as an adult to sort of be revisiting something that's such a part of your childhood. I was so moved every day to be um, involved in that world again, you know, that I still recall so, so well. And, I mean, I can't watch the first film without crying, and um, it's, just a very tender kind of place in myself. 
and um, how did I play the piano? Uh, <laughs> and, um, I, I mean, it was brilliantly written. That was the thing. I mean, it was all there, and that's why I think people never say it. It's like, you just have to do it. <laughs> they wrote this beautiful role. So delicate and so um, perceptive. Um, and so clever to get that in there whilst also making it kind of, the whole thing fantastical and magical and thrilling. Um, then you have a great song or two. <laughs> <laughs> that helps. Um, I don't know, I don't know, you just kind of um, I, it was it was very instinctive. I don't know. I didn't have to think too much about it. It, 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 it is so honest and true. And I just indulge me one second. We've only been screening the film for about four weeks, <clears throat> but I have gotten so many uh, unsolicited emails and phone calls from fathers and grandfathers who are so moved at the portrayal of that character, uh, how that character is written, and how you directed it in his ability to be honest with his children about what he can and can't do, his emotional reality in front of his children. And I, it has spoken to dads in a way that I, I never saw coming. And I, so I, I sort of wanted to point that out and share that with you because yeah. it's having such a, it, it, it speaks so much to today. Yeah. You know, what, what, what dads try and hopefully uh, hold on to for their families. Well, you should say that I was thinking about my brother because my brother has two kids, and he's very anxious, my, my brother. And, 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 and very, you know, it's hard to be, a, I, I did think about him, and I did think about, because I'm not a father, I don't know what it's like. But I thought about my, my brother and about how difficult it is for him to have those two little ones, and the anxiety and the stress and the money and jobs and everything, and food and blah. I thought about that. It's not even the being a father. It's a huge part of it, but it's also just Michael's dilemma. Because I've had many people come up to me as well, Mark, and they've said to me, I, I'm Michael. You, you don't realize, I'm, I'm like, okay, I get it. You know, it, it, it hits the core of a lot of people. Well, let me so ask you, John, let me ask you a question, because you do so much in uh, so many ways, from choreography to producing to really in an unspoken way, the the yin and the yang to Rob, since you've been partners for so long. And so just, because I can ask the question, uh, what, what any observation, because the group film is so much, so much of your contribution, so much obviously Rob in the center, and just any observations or, or, or thoughts on that experience in this particular film, knowing it's his most personal film? Well, yeah, I mean, I think people have touched upon it. It, it really is. He does have this, he, he's the greatest parent I've ever seen. He, he, he's so unselfish in his care of people and the art of making movies that no matter how huge the pressures are, we walk onto the set, we walk into any area where the actors or the crew or any people working for him uh, are, and he just has this way of turning on this positive energy that's all, it's all about them, and it's all about you. It's all about taking care and nurturing. And, and, and so Mary Poppins, I feel that this was not only the right time, but it's the right time because the right man was here to share his vision with, with the world. And I think it, it, it's just, it, the perfect time because God was here to, to make it. Thank you, John. Mark Shaman, so uh, uh, composer extraordinaire and uh, some shoes to fill. Uh, just how this, why this movie for you came, came and, and how you how you accomplished it so beautifully. Like everyone else, I you know it was an extremely large part of my childhood. I think it was the complete. My entire childhood was Mary Poppins. I really have no other memory of my childhood <laughs> except listening to that record and reading the synopsis of the story and, being, and, and the fact that I would grow up and even as a child had the ability to write music and lyrics and was even fascinated by the orchestrations of it. And it starts with that F triad. 
which I learned later. <laughs> and it's violins, tremolo, which I learned later. And then the English horn comes in on the birds. And I didn't know what those instruments were. I was four. And I didn't know what those words were. A man has dreams of walking with giants that comes and each in the edifice of time. Before the moral of his mortar of his zeal has a chance to congeal. I mean, I was four years old. <laughs> and I talked to him. <laughs> I knew what I wanted to know. I mean, and, and, and that, that reprise, I just, the lyrics are the chords. Why are those chords making me feel something so deeply? And it's not just the chords, but it's the strings and the way that they're playing those chords. And so all these things are just flowing into my brain and my ears and my heart. And, and I learned everything I could from that album. So then I grew up and this dream came true where I got to incorporate every single thing that I ever learned from that album into real life and got to write the songs with Scott and then got to score the movie, which is a whole other thing outside of songwriting. And, I, and it's so nice to see everyone. This is the odd thing about scoring the movie, I'm sure for the editor as well, and Lord knows Rob and John, but we live with your images, every frame of them. <laughs> you know, 30 frames a second. I know, I know you all so intimate. <laughs> And wanting, and you have to work in concert with you. And so I feel like I, I you know, I've sometimes gone up to stars at movies I've scored, and they're like, get, the, get away from me, who are you? I'm like, I know you so well, Jack Nicholson. I know you. But, but to get the chance to spend the months and the year of scoring this movie and getting to work with these people and these faces and these eyes and, and the body language, it was just a fantasy. Scott, you, uh, you write the lyrics with, with, with Mark, and the range of, of, the, of the wordplay and the lyrics in this piece, from the, from the witty, from, the, from, the, from the, <clears throat> the rap that you said in music hall, uh, music for, for Lynn, to the profundity of uh, nothing's gone forever, only out of place. It's just such an extraordinary range. It's just, just the challenge of, of accomplishing all that and how that comes. Uh, well, thank you. How, how Mark learned the word niche and edifice. I hope the uh, today kids will say, "What, what mommy? What's bathtub chin?" <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yes, we went back to the books. But we had a lovely. Ex I think my favorite part of the whole experience was the months that Rob, John, David, Mark, and I spent together in the books and, and carving out what the musical numbers were going to be. And, I think that's probably one of the most creative times I've had in my very long time in <laughs> Fantastic. And lastly, lastly, but certainly uh, uh, with, with the highest regard, uh, David, because the, the screenplay is, is, first of all, so technically proficient and so it, it complicated, but so simple in its complications, I mean, if, if that makes sense. The, the, the experience of, of, of finding that story, as Rob mentioned, that you and John and Rob came up with sending it into the, into the depression and, and what that means for today. And, but just the experience of having to write that complicated of a story and yet so simple, and also the voices of those characters being so true. I mean, just Mary alone, the way she observes her keen observations that she makes and how you found the words for those are just really extraordinary. Just that experience, if you could. Thank you. Yeah, um, I have to second what Scott said. The period when we were we were coming up with our story, when we were building it together. First, it was uh, with uh, Rob and John and trying to find the, how we were going to frame the story. And then Mark and Scott uh, joined us with the five of us sitting in a room together a couple of times a week and talking through where we wanted this journey to take us and how we could get to a story that. Uh, would uh, echo in some way our feeling for that original film. Uh, that was the most magical kind of collaboration time I've ever had. And, and it would be very easy to enter into a project like this feeling like uh, you were walking on sacred ground or you could fall at any moment. And uh, the fact that Rob was doing it was the primary reason I was willing even to talk about doing it because he's a master of his books and from the 
first day we started collaborating together, I felt like we all had each other's back. We all were protecting each other's work, and we were all telling the same story. So that's really where this all began for me. And just listening to everyone talk has been kind of moving for me. To hear the passion that everyone has for this project, I think that's what made this turn into the film that it was. I think we all understood what we wanted to create, and it's really magical to hear that passion and everyone down the line, because that's what I felt the whole time I was working on. It's well said. I think all of us got that from the whole journey. So thank you all. I'm going to turn it over to now some, some questions and, and do the best I can to see. And yes, please. <laughs> Well, congratulations to everyone. An incredible, incredible job. I felt like I was back in 1964. Philadelphia with my grandmother watching the original. And I have to say, Lynn, you as Jack, every time you're on screen, your smile is happiness. <laughs> but my question is going to go out to Rob, Mark, two other composers and writer, producers. I'm curious how you found the balance of the touchstones to the original film. Because within here, I see the chalk drawing in the third act that appears on the sidewalk. You look in the attic, and there are little placements in production design of things that were in the original nursery. And then you have your musical, your instrumental passages within the score itself, so beautifully integrated with Let's Go Fly a Kite, even step in time. So I'm curious how you all determine the balance between the nods to the past while taking this forward into the future. It was the balancing act, you might have just jumped in, it was the balancing act of the whole film and the creation of the film the entire time. That's what we were doing. I really felt that everyone who was a part of this needed to have the first film in their blood in some way because that's what we were following. And so we were looking for that balance throughout the entire time we were working on this film. And, you know, I, I used myself as a barometer, I have to say. Because I thought, well, and you know, what would I want to see? I would want to, if I came to a sequel to Mary Poppins, I would want to see an animation sequence of live action. And I would want it to be hand drawn and, and a 2D world. I would want to see that. I would want it, I would want Cherry Tree Lane to have a curve to it. Because that's the Cherry Tree Lane we all know. I would feel disappointed if it was a straight street. I mean, it was as simple as that. Although we were finding our new way, there were things, there were sort of goalposts or signposts throughout that we need to hold on to because it's in the DNA of the material. I knew there needed to be, John, I really wanted a big, huge production number that, that Mark and Scott wrote so beautifully uh, with, uh, with uh, athletic dancers, men with Mary and Jack, Jack leading the entire piece. That needed to be in there in some way. I would feel that if it wasn't there, we'd gone off track. So it was a way of, it was this insane balancing act of, of, of honoring the first film, but at the same time forging our own way, our own story. Setting it in the 30s helped with that. Having Michael and Jane grown up and seeing what's happened to them and how that, and what and for their journey and, and the, what they lost along the way helped that. But it was, it was constantly back and forth, and I have to say, I just used my own gut about what needed to be there, what we needed to reflect, pay homage. Mark and Scott were incredibly careful uh, about making sure that we didn't abuse using themes from the first film. It's so easy to use. We used it in very strategic places throughout the film. Most of it actually, very much at the end, where we feel we earned it by then. And that's what Mark was very careful about doing. So, but it was all that. I feel like, you know, the whole time it was that. But I did feel that we were coming from the right place. And that was the key. Yes, yes okay. Hi, uh, Stephen Chamber here for the Boston Herald. Uh, I just wanted to give a shout out to Ben Wishaw for the beyond brilliant performance in A Very English Scandal. Uh, with you, Grant, it's extraordinary. Uh, but for Emily and Lynn, uh, one thing I felt this Mary Poppins had was uh, a sensuality between the two of you <laughs> that was like, uh, uh, part of the 1960s. Still <laughs> <laughs> uh, characters is, you know, very sort of 21st century. This is a quite white talk, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
First of all, I would urge you to rewatch the first film. <laughs> Because everyone was like, wow, there's rapping in Mary Poppins Returns. Forgets that Bert has a 30 second rap about all the women he dated before Mary Poppins. You've all forgotten it. Uh, but John Holiday is one big flirt uh, between Mary and, and, and Bert. Um, so I don't know if you want to handle the white hot sensuality. <laughs> never felt that it was sort of romantic between them necessarily, but she she doesn't mind flirting with a with a laborer. That's sort of <laughs>
is so true, and she doesn't um, shy away from the fact that they've lost something, but that there's cracks of light, you know, and there's and there's something to learn from, and the idea of loss being something that they can digest as children and not, and, and, and to walk through, you know, that you are going to walk through this loss, but that nothing's gone forever in the outer place. It's just such a hopeful way to look at loss, really. We have time for one or two more. Yes, sir. Hi, um, this may be a little bit of a dirty question, um, but uh, we, we meet uh, Mill Street as Cousin Topsy and learn that uh, every Wednesday, or every second Wednesday, our world turns upside down. Mary Poppins asks for the second Tuesday of every month off. Is there <laughs> reasons? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Wait, I'm talking about it. Well, it's Cousin Topsy, Mary. <laughs> I think we changed it because at one point it was second Monday, wasn't it? Yeah. And then we looked at our, and then we were looking at our actual calendar of what was happening during this week that she's there. And it's only a week that she's there. It's kind of unbelievable. And so we then changed it to Wednesday. But the second part of it, what I love is there's a connection with her and with Mary Poppins and all of her cousins and uncles. They all have a connection. And this love, and I love that you saw that there's a second Tuesday for her, for Mary, and second Wednesday for for Topsy, it's 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 it, and this is all these are all from this is all material from the books, you know these these references and David was able you can speak beautifully about that David, but we were able to find some of these great nuggets from the books themselves. We were lucky enough to be able to incorporate that, although our chronology changed as we developed the story. We didn't, at first we thought is this a month? Is this two weeks? Is this how many days is this? And as we uh, we worked forward, we tightened the, uh, the chronology to, to increase the kind of urgency of the, the journey. And as we did, we realized, well, if they meet on a Sunday and they have to uh, get the, uh, the get to the bank by the end of the day Friday, and we have to kind of change as we go along. And so uh, there was some adjusting, and these folks were forced to adjust their lyrics. Wednesday, right? Wednesday, right? Thursday, right? Tuesday, right? Tuesday, right? Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah uh, let's see if we get somebody in the back there. Yes, sir. Can I Emily, the question is for you. Um, I have to imagine that there is, sorry, I have to imagine that there is an incredible inherent pressure playing the role of Mary Poppins. How do you balance Julie Andrews' extraordinary performance with the P.L. Travers version in the books while adding your own personal signature as well? Um, I think. Um, for me, what I what I decided to do was was even though I'd seen it as a child, was was not watch the original um, so close to shooting our version um, because I think probably because she is so beautiful and so extraordinary, and it, you know I think I would have maybe tried to I don't know try to accommodate in some way you know in some bigger way what she did um, and and. Um, let that sort of bleed into what I wanted to do. And so I just decided if I'm going to do this, I'm just going to go on my gut instinct from the book because she is rather different in the in in all of the books, you know. And um, that was the decision really is just to if I was going to carve out new space for myself, it was gonna to have to be um, without watching Julie, the details of what Julie did so close to shooting, and I have this searing memory of Mary Poppins, um, but not of all of the tiny details of how she played the character. And so as soon as we wrapped, I watched the original and was just floored by it, you know, probably relieved that I hadn't watched it, because I think I was like, oh my gosh, she's amazing, you know. Um, and I showed my daughter it, you know. Um, did I answer it? Is that it? Yeah. <laughs> Let's take one more question and we're going to have to, to wrap up or to go back. Yeah, sir. Okay. Uh, well, for Robin and you, the filmmakers, who can speak to it also, the visual effects of the original Mary Poppins were groundbreaking at the time. And of course, now audiences have seen everything the computer can do. So, how did you want to design those sequences? Like you mentioned, you wanted an animated sequence again. Uh, so that it was retro enough to fit Mary Poppins and yet still. Uh, Carved new territory. 
I mean, I, I try as much as I can to do it as real as possible, and that's why I was so anxious and excited to shoot on location. I mean, Lynn drives by St. Paul's, that is St. Paul's Cathedral. And, in, and of course, in the first film, it's that beautiful Peter Allen Shaw painting. But because we were setting this in the 30s in a more real time, I really loved the juxtaposition between the real world that we were shooting in this real family. I wanted you to really connect emotionally to these people and know that they were real. And then these Fantasias, that an adventure that Mary Poppins takes them on, then we can go so many places and come back to this real world. And the hope for me was that by the end of the film, they combine, they collide. And so all of a sudden, you know, Michael is at a place emotionally where he can bring fantasy into his real life. And that's when he has that beautiful moment where he says, I never thought I'd feel such joy and wonder ever again. I thought that door was closed to me forever, which is the door opening that Mary Poppins was speaking to him and she can leave. But it was really sort of finding that real world and then these two different worlds. That was, that, that was and, you know, that was actually the, the plan. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much, Megan. Very excited to return to the session.